That's the one you Okay, um, let's get started. Uh, just so everybody's aware, a uh, little bit of updates on just logistics and whatnot. Uh, the attendance grades are up to date. Um, homework 5.3 to 6.1 are graded. Homework 6.2 is being graded. Uh, 6.3 was due today. How'd that homework go? That was the continuously braced beam design. Did that go well? Yeah. Okay. Um, that homework assignment is the end of continuously braced beam design. If you remember, I said that um, there are two classes of beams that we need to consider in steel design, and those are beams that are continuously braced and beams that are discreetly braced. Um, today what we're going to do is begin our discussion of beams that are discreetly braced. And the thing about discreetly braced beams is that discreetly braced beams like to buckle. Okay? So if you remember when we first started talking about buckling for columns, we, um, we broke out the differential equations. And we're going to do that today as well. Only from an explanation standpoint. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you, the derivation that we are about to show is a lot more involved. But I'm not going to get too far into the weeds of how involved it is, but I do want to make a couple of points about it. Okay? And so before we get into that, um, that um, derivation and that discussion, I have here a couple of derivatives on the board. Okay? Um, and I want to make a point about something, okay? So for those of you who remember all of the intricacies of Matthew 29, uh, help me out. What is the derivative of this first uh, expression on the top? What is the derivative of 5 times sine of the x? Five the 5 times the cosine of x. Okay? And so what we had here, so let's talk about that. So what we had is we had a function multiplied by a coefficient and particularly what was important about this is that this was a constant coefficient, okay? This was a constant coefficient, all right? Um, and so what that meant is that we could essentially pull out the 5 and we could say, um, we could pull out the 5 and just treat the derivative of the function independently, right? Leave the, co uh, the constant coefficient as a multiplier. So my question then is, if we were to look at this, would this be the answer? No. Is that the case? No, it's not. That's wrong, right? The reason that's wrong is because this x to the third is not a constant coefficient. This x to the third... This is a variable coefficient, okay? And so if you start treating variable coefficients like constant coefficients, your answer is going to be wrong. Is, is that, I think we're all sort of in agreement about that if we start going into the land of calculus. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, with that, let me get into my notes and uh, I'll, I'll sort of show you what, why I brought that up. Um, if you could do me a favor... I want everybody to open your manual just to table 1-1, just, to, just to, to the W-shaped table, because I'm going to show you that here in a second, because I kind of want to just have that for reference. Okay? All right. So let, let's, let's get into a discussion of lateral torsional buckling for beams. So again, warning, we're going to see some calculus, we're going to see some differential equations uh, approaching. So I don't expect you to do the whole thing. I don't expect you to know every little aspect of what it is that we're going to do. But if there's one salient point I really want you to focus on when we get, uh, when we get to uh, the, the crux of our derivation, it is that constant coefficients versus variable coefficients are handled differently in the land of differential calculus and in the land of differential equations. And what we are going to do in our derivation is treat everything like it's a constant when we're looking at our coefficients and our differential equation. And that's going to be an accurate uh, um, assumption 
for every component but one of them. And that one is a real important one, and we're going to have to correct our answer with this term called CB. And you'll see what I mean when we get into that. Okay, now let me go back to bracing and unbrace length, and I just want to make sure that everybody kind of remembers this discussion. Okay, so for example, here I have a beam. This beam is simply supported, um, and what I have over here is a, a, a schematic that is illustrating the difference between the length of the beam and the unbraced length of the beam. So for instance, if this beam is 30 foot long, the length of the beam is 30 feet, the LB is 10 feet, okay? Now up until now, what we've been doing is discussing beams that have an LB of zero, okay? That they are continuously braced, there's an infinite number of braces. And if the unbraced length is zero, then the flexural capacity is just MP, just the plastic moment. But now we're going to look at discreetly braced beams. And for discreetly braced beams, what we're going to find is that if LB is greater than zero, we don't yet know what the capacity is. That's what we have to discuss today. Now, um, what ends up happening for a beam that is discreetly braced, what happens in the real world, is a phenomenon called lateral torsional buckling. Okay? Now, what lateral torsional buckling is, is essentially the buckling mode that a steel beam um, experiences when it's put under flexure about the strong axis. So I have a beam, a simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load. I put a bunch of load on the top and I, and I apply that load. So whenever you have a beam, part of the beam's in compression, part of the beam's in tension. And things in compression like to buckle. But the problem with a beam is that part of the beam wants to buckle, but part of it doesn't. The part of the beam that's in tension wants to stay still, okay? The part of the beam that's in compression wants to buckle. And the beam sort of doesn't really know how to handle that. And the only way that the beam can figure out how to deal with it is it sort of kicks out and twists. So here's the beam, and it sort of does this, and it twists. Hence, lateral torsional buckling. That's, that's what's going on. Okay, and so this is sort of a, a, um, a conceptual schematic of it. This is sort of what it looks like in the real world. So this is a series of eye shapes. This is from a bridge that was in Canada. Uh, this was a failure that occurred during construction at a, uh, in around 2015. And so you can see what I'm talking about. The beams were having to support their own self weight. And the idea is that the braces between the beams were supposed to prevent that buckling from occurring, and it didn't. <laughs> um, and so the braces ended up failing, and because the braces ended up failing, the, beam, the beam's LB value went up, and because the beam's unbraced length went up, the capacity went down, and the beam buckled. And you can see what I'm talking about, that the beam sort of kicked out and it twisted. Um, I'm not going to pull this up, but I have this in my lecture notes. This is from a lab test of a beam. They actually put a camera on it and did a lab test start to finish, and you can see here's the beam, here's the load that they're applying, and you can see the force uh, and displacement as the beam is being loaded. This is definitely one of those tests that you could watch or maybe put on YouTube, do it at two times speed and actually see the beam kick out and twist. It's a really cool um, uh, uh, um, view of what it looks like when a beam actually fails uh, in this mode. Now, in order to derive an expression, okay, what we need to do is we need to start establishing our governing equations for the problem and so the first thing that I want to do is I want to talk about torsion. So we're going to go back to the wonderful land of Engineering 216, Mechanics of Deformable Bodies, right? For those of you that, that, that had me for the class, this was something that we handled somewhat early in the semester. We did axial loads, and then we did torsion. Um, so if you remember, um, if you have an element that's being twisted, you can compute its angle of twist as TL over GJ, okay? T being the torque that you're, the torsion or the torque that you're applying, L being the length, J being the polar moment of inertia for a circular cross section. And then if you remember, G is a material property. Like if E is Young's modulus, 29,000 KSI for steel, G is a shear modulus for steel. For steel, G is about 11,200 KSI. So it's a constant value uh, as well, okay? Now, if you want, what you can do is you can also rewrite this a different way. You can rewrite it in a differential expression. You can say T is GJ times the rate of twist. I use X, I used X here. 
times the rate of twist. So you can write it in a differential equation uh, mode if you would like. You can either say that the angle of twist, if everything's constant, is TL over GJ, or you can write it like this. Now, you might not remember this, but let me bring it back to the land of engineering 216. Uh, if whenever you did torsion in that class, definitely when, when, I, when I taught the class, whenever you did torsion, one of the things that you do not deal with in engineering 216 is torsion of sections that are not circular. Okay? We either did solid shafts or pipes. Okay? And there was a reason for that. Okay? If, does anybody remember the reason? It's right here on the slide, but does anybody remember why we did torsion only of circular shafts? What's the problem with non-circular shafts? Non-circular shafts warp. Okay? Non-circular shafts deform in and out of the plane of rotation. Right? So if I take a circular shaft and I apply a torsion, it just twists. Whereas, and by, by twists, I mean the, sec, the cross section just rotates. Whereas, whereas if I have a cross section that is not circular, it warps. It, yes, sir. So you mean that it's uniform? Uh, when the cylinder twists, it's going to be uniform all the way around, but because of the I-beam, it's not going to be as uniform material around. Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is not only does the cross section actually rotate, but it actually deforms in and out of the plane. Like, so here's a circular cross section. When I apply a torsion, that's all it does. But for an I beam, not only does it rotate, but it rotates and it does this. It goes in and out of the plane. And that's only something that non circular cross sections do. Okay? Um, circular cross sections don't do that. It's why, if you look at axles on cars, if you look at camshafts, any machine element that is primarily designed to withstand torsion, the cross sections are circular, either a solid shaft or a pipe. Okay? Now, for I beams, we don't have that luxury because they're not circular. So instead of this differential equation being used for an I beam, we need one that's a little bit more involved. So instead of just the torsion equaling this, we're going to say it equals this minus this effect due to warping. So now our differential equation gets a little bit more involved. Now I could go into deriving that equation if you'd like. I haven't really done that, but suffice it to say, the reason that this is a third derivative is because when you actually get into the mechanics, the warping resistance that you get in an I-beam is an effect of the shear in the flanges. And so if moment is related to the second derivative, shear is related to the third derivative. That's, that's why we have a, a third derivative there. Again, I'm really not trying to get too far into the weeds on the, the differential equation stuff. I just kind of want to get you to have a conceptual idea of what's going on. I'm happy to go through it uh, if you'd like. Now, I want to put things in perspective with LTB in terms of the complexity of the derivation. It's not hard, and what I mean, what I, that's the wrong word to say. It's not hard, but it's longer. It's a much longer derivation. See, with column buckling, we only had this differential equation. And from this differential equation, we came up with this answer. With beam buckling, we have three differential equations that we kind of have to combine together. And so we have the first differential equation, which just relates to the beam deflecting up and down. You take a beam, you put load on it, it deflects down. Then you have a second differential equation related to the beam deflecting left to right, that lateral deflection. And basically all it is is this one with a little bit of trig in there. And then the third one is the twisting, the twisting effect. So suffice it to say that the, the derivation, I don't really think it's more difficult per se, but it definitely is more involved. Now, what you end up doing when you combine all this, what you end up doing is you do a lot of substitutions, you combine into this, and you end up with this differential equation right here. It's a fourth order differential equation. Okay? How many of you have had or are in Math 335? So if you're in it, you know, you're basically saying like the fourth derivative of y plus the second derivative of y times 6 plus, the, plus y times 12 equals 0, solve for y, right? And those are, those are um, problems that you've probably dealt with in Math 335, I'm guessing, something like that. Am I right? Okay. Now, it's more involved, a little bit more complicated than column buckling, but we can produce a solution. Now note that the solution, and this is our solution, it's written in terms of LB, not L, because what we care about 
is the distance between the braces, not how long the beam is. Okay? Um, but there's a problem with this derivation. There's a big problem. And the problem relates to what I was talking about up here. So let's look at this differential equation. Okay? And I asked you all to open up table 1-1. I want you to look at just any eye shape. It doesn't really matter. For any eye shape, can you look up CW? Yeah. It's a number, right? It's a constant, right? For any eye shape cross section, C is a constant, right? Let's write this derivation down. Let, let's, or let's write this differential equation down. So we have this times the fourth derivative minus this times the second derivative plus this times the function equals zero. Looks a lot like a differential equation, only instead of y's, we have phi values. So is E a constant for steel? That's a constant. Is CW a constant for an eye shape? Yes. Is G a constant for steel? Yes. Is J a constant for steel? Yes. Or for the given shape, you can look up J. What about E? What about IY? The problem is that. The moment. How many moment diagrams in C312 that we deal with look like that? Not many, right? If I drew the moment diagram for this beam right here, like just look at this beam. The moment diagram probably does something about like that. That isn't constant, right? I have a different moment here than I do here than I do here. The moment is variable. Now, if I look at that differential equation, it's like, man, if I could treat moment as a constant, that'd make that dip Q a whole lot easier to solve, and that's right. The solution that we produce assumes that moment is constant, but moment isn't constant. It's not. So I propose that the solution that we derived on this slide that assumes moment is constant is not good enough. What we must do is correct that solution. We must correct that solution with an adjustment factor that accounts for the fact that moment is variable. That is what CB is. And that's going to be our primary discussion today, is computing CB. So what is CB? CB is a moment gradient modifier. It adjusts the solution for lateral torsional buckling to account for the fact that moment is variable. Okay. So here's how it works. What you do is, let's say you have a beam, and the beam has six different unbraced segments. For each unbraced segment, you compute a CB term. Okay. So within each unbraced segment, what you do is you get the moments at quarter points. So if the segment is 20 foot long, get a moment at 5 feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, you get the quarter point moments and then the maximum moment within that segment. Take the maximum moment and the quarter point moments, plug and chuck. Okay? Now, a couple of user notes about CB. All of the moments that you plug into the CB uh, expression are absolute values. And you'll see what I mean because we're actually going to do this example today that has a moment distribution like this. And so you'll see what I mean with positive and negative moments. The other thing is that it does not matter if you go left to right. So for example, if you have an unbraced segment, you could go A, B, C, or you could go A, B, C. It wouldn't matter, you get the same answer. You get the same answer, you can look at the expression. We're doing the same thing to the left and right quarter point moments, so it doesn't really matter. So within each unbraced segment, you get the quarter point moments, and M max. So, for example, if we're looking at this beam, this is a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load. So, if the unbraced length is just the, if I only have braces at the ends, so here's MA, MB, and MC, the maximum moment just happens to equal the center moment, plug and chuck. Does that make sense? Don't worry, we're, we're going to have an example going through this, a somewhat involved example. By the way, before we get into the, the, our example for today, let's break out 
a pop quiz from CE 312. Do you all remember this type of problem and looking at deriving moment functions? Remember when we were looking at deflections, we had to derive moment functions for a beam in order to integrate it using virtual work? How many moment functions are we going to need for this beam to fully define the moment diagram? Two. Two, two right? Because remember, remember how you do that? You start here, and we have that, that, so that's a function. And then when we get here, we have a reaction, so we have a new function. Y'all remember that? So we're going to have to do that today. So this problem is only going to need two moment functions in order to fully define the moment diagram. Okay, so let's actually talk about that example. Now, before you all start writing, I did a little bit of uh, help with, uh, for you on the structural analysis side, so let me show you something. So we are going to determine CB quantities for this being shown. Okay. Now, a couple things. Number one, before you start writing, I want, I want everybody to pay attention. So first thing, if you notice, the loads on the structure have already been factored. So these are not dead loads or live loads. These are factored loads. Okay. Whenever you're computing CB, deal in factored loads. Do not try and uh, uh, separate that. Um, the load already includes the beam self-weight. I'm not going to worry about that. Okay. The other thing I wanted to show you is here's the, the beam, here's the shear diagram, here's the moment diagram. I actually put that in the notebook. Um, now, for the shear diagram, I've already drawn the shear diagram for you, and uh, I've integrated it. Now, just as a side note, if I was designing this beam, what I would do is I would design this beam for a shear of negative 37.5 kips. That's the largest magnitude shear that is present on the shear diagram. Now, if you take a classic reinforced concrete design, or even steel design where you're looking at plate girders or some more slender elements, you do need to consider the shear distribution for things like stirrups and concrete or, uh, or um, uh, shear stiffeners and steel design. And again, we'll talk about steel later, but it's not really going to matter for our discussion today. And so what do we have? Lot to a little, little to a lot, lot to a little. Here's our moment diagram, uh, and we have this right here. So what I've done, and I, it's going to take you all a little while to copy this down, so I'm going to give you a minute. But I put here the example here, and then I copied the shears and moment diagrams right there. So I'll give you a minute to copy all this down, and then we'll get into the land of CB computations. And uh, I'm actually going to leave this up here. Because like we said, there's going to be, what do we say, there's going to be two moment functions. A moment function for this part, and a moment function for this part. Because again, what we've got is we've got a reaction right there. and a reaction right there. And so while y'all write this down, if you want to think about um, what CB is, CB is kind of like a slope of the moment diagram, and I use that with strong quotation marks. Um, so it's true that if you had a segment of a moment diagram that was constant, you would compute CB and you would get a CB of 1. It would be 1. CB is only higher than 1 when the moment is variable. But I say, I say quote-unquote slope because CB doesn't care whether it's going up or going down. It just really cares about how much the moment is changing. All right. Does everybody have this? Everybody have this? So I'm going to scroll down a little bit, and here's our shear diagram and moment diagram if you want to copy that. Let me give you a minute. 
Really what's important is the moment diagram. That's probably what's most important. So what I'll do is I'll sort of copy this up here. Um, so, so we'll do this. And I may have to adjust my diagram a little bit. But one thing I can tell you is that that zero, that zero, and this is negative 225. I'm actually not going to in indicate that peak here on the board, and, and you'll see why here in a little bit. Okay. And so just so you're aware, we have a brace here, a brace here, a brace here, and a brace there. Okay. All right. Now remind me, how many different um, moment functions do we have for this beam? You said two? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this beam, and I'm going to go back to uh, CE312, and I'm going to say what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut two sections. Oh. I need to turn that on. I'm going to do section 1-1, one, one, section 2-2. Two, two. Let's see if you all remember this from structural analysis. If I cut section 1-1, one, one, which is the easier direction to look, to the left or to the right? If I cut section 2-2, two, two, which is the easier way to look, to the left or to the right? Right, okay. So what I'll do is let's start off with section 1-1 one, one looking to the left. Let's see if y'all remember how to do this. So, man, I don't know what's going on there. So let's, let's do that a little bit better. So section 1-1 one, one looking left is going to look something like this. So I have a reaction. That reaction has, is 22.5 kips. I have a distributed load. The distributed load is 2 kips per foot. Here's where I cut the section. Somebody help me out. How long is that distance right there? X. X. There we go. Everybody's remembering that now. So this is X. Okay. And then we have an unknown shear, an unknown moment. I can take this point load, collapse it, in, or this distributed load, collapse it into a point load. How much is that point load? 2X. At a distance from the cut of x over 2. Does everybody remember this? Been a while, I know, but we did this. I know we did it together, right? So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, summing moments about the cut. So what do we have? We have... 22.5 times x. We have 2x times x over 2 over here. We have m over here, so 22.5x equals m plus what? x squared. So m equals, we'll call this m1 is 22.5x minus x squared, and that should be valid from 0 to 30. Because again, that moment diagram, that this is a single parabola right here that goes from x equals 0 to x equals 30. So, There's that parabola right there. 
Is that bringing it back? Been a while since we did this, hasn't it? So now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and derive this function. So you said looking right is the easier way of doing this. So let's see what that looks like. So section 2-2, two, two, looking right. So So, so there's that. Do we have any reactions? Keep in mind, this is section, so this right here, this is section 2-2. Two, two. This right here, this is section 1-1. One, one. Do we have any reactions over here? Or just the distributed bank, just the distributed load? Right. So just the distributed load. This length is x. And then we have our upward shear moment that looks like that. And then what do we have? We have same thing as before. Although both of our moments are going to be on the left side because we've got M and we have 2x times x over 2. We don't have anything over here. So m plus x squared is 0. m is minus x squared. So we'll call that m2. And since we're going from the right, this is x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3, all the way to here, which is x equals 15. Is, is, is this bringing it back? D tell me if, if I'm going too fast, because I'm sort of assuming that we remember stuff from last semester, but I know that was a long time ago, so. Right. So this function here, negative x squared, and I guess I should say this is x2, this, x1. All right. Does that make sense? All right, I want to stop for a second. Take it in. Take it in what we're doing so far. Anybody have any questions? Going too far? Going too fast? What's that? No, a little too fast. What what I miss? What we miss? No, I just feel like I'm just writing down the whole time. Oh, okay, no, no, I no, I understand. I understand. Does anybody need to catch up on anything? I can take a sec. Tell you what, this next part is probably going to take it a little slower. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take each segment one at a time and compute the CV values. Okay, so let's take it, let's take each segment one at a time. Alright. So let's start off with segment one. Let's start off with segment one. Okay. So the first segment of the beam looks something like this. So we have A distributed load okay we have a support right here we have a reaction the reaction is 22.5 kips this is two kips per foot and I think what's most critical is that we have a brace right here and we'll call it a brace right here. Now help me out. What's the distance between those braces on this problem? 15. 15. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say LB is 15 feet. Okay. Okay. Now, 
If we look at the moment diagram for this part of the problem, okay, the moment diagram under this point and this point looks like this. So it goes over and up. That's kind of what it does. That's what the moment diagram looks like, right? That's this part right here. So basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm just drawing this aspect of it, okay? Now, what we need to do is we need to compute quarter point moments, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split this up into quarters. So I'm gonna say we need a moment right here. I'm gonna say we need a moment right here, and we'll say we'll need a moment, I don't know, right here. Let's just see what they are, okay? So we'll call this MA, MB, MC. Now, how do I do that? Well, I know that M1 equals 22.5 X minus X squared. <coughs> Bless you, that's what we computed. So this is 15 feet, right? If this is 15 feet, how far is it from here to here? What's this distance? 15 over 4, 15 over four which is what, 3.75? So in other words, like, here's what I'm getting at. Would you agree that this distance... Oh, This is 3.75 feet. 3.75 feet. 3.75 feet. 3.75 feet. Is that right? Would that be okay? So, MA is M1 at 3.75. What is that? What is that? Seven zero point three. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. How do I do MB then? Add another three point seven five. So what do I do? M one at what? Seven point five. Seven point five. So what I do is I say twenty two point five times seven point five minus seven point five squared. And one thing I'll tell you is that the units, as long as the units are consistent, they don't really matter all that much because you're taking moments over moments at the end. So, one twelve point five. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, how do I do MC? So M1, oh, there we go. 126.7? Wait, do we have a second on that? Six. Six. Wait, say that again. 126.6? Yeah. Do I, so 126.6, I got that right? Okay, now, so I've got an MA, MB, and MC. Do those values kind of look right on the moment diagram? Like this is about 70, this is about 112, 
This is about this. Okay, so I need MA and MB and MC, but I also need M max. How do I get M max? Well, there's a couple of ways to get M max. One way to do it is to actually just graphically draw the, the, the shear diagram and the moment diagram and see what the peak is. Another way of doing it is to uh, take the derivative of the shear function or the moment function. So the derivative is 22.5 minus 2x, right? And so set that equal to zero. And so what do we get? We get x is 11.25. Did I do that right? You tell me, did I do that right? So what is this telling me? This is telling me that if I plug in this number into that equation, it will give me the maximum moment along that segment. But did I already get that? That's MC. Do y'all see that? Because when I plug this in, I would get the maximum moment, but that's what I plugged in here. So therefore, M max equals MC, which is 126.6. I want to make sure that's clear. Sound good? So therefore, CB is really easy to compute. Therefore, CB is a full fraction on the bottom. It's 2.5 M max plus 3 MA plus 4 MB plus 3 MC. And on the top, 12.5 M max. So, And so let's say like two decimal places, just to see that we all get the same answer. Anybody got an answer for me? 11.66? No, I, I tell you that doesn't sound right. No. 1.16. That sounds a lot better. Got and five seconds on that? Boom. That's your CB. Does that make sense on how to compute CB? That's basically it. Okay. Now, the only thing that we need to do is we need to just repeat this for the remaining segments. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm not going to do this segment with you because we do not have time, but I do want to do the central segment. The central segment is really important. Okay. So, let me stop for a second and see if anybody has any questions. Is this so far so good? Okay, let's do the central segment. So we'll call this segment two. Okay, so what segment two looks like So what are we looking at? We've got a brace right here. Then we've got another brace right here, but we also have our 
um, support right there, and we have that reaction. That reaction is, I believe, 67.5. And again, this is 15 feet. When we look at the moment diagram, you know, here's the moment diagram. The moment diagram kind of does like, kind of looks like this. Kind of looks like that. All right. Same function, same function, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to split this up into quarter points, and we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to need to, you know, split it up like this, like this, and like this. So... And again, because it's 15 feet, these are each 3.75. But here's a couple kickers. Kicker one. So do I do this? Do I do that? No, because x, this is x equals 0 x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals This is x equals 15. This is x equals 30. So ma is at x equals what? 18.75. mb is m1 at x equals what? 22.5. mc is m1 at x equals, what is that, 25.25 um, or 26.25? 26.25. What are these? So, I mean, we can chuck it out. It's in B zero. MB is zero? If I'm looking at it right. That's, my parabola might be off. I'll tell you it's small. I don't think it's zero. Well, or is it zero? 22, I don't know. 22.5 times 22. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's zero. Sorry, sorry. There, so I have, a, I think what I did is I changed the numbers from last time. It's like five point something. It's really tiny. So don't trust your artwork there is all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, you're, yeah, it is. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Sorry. All right. I see it. Sorry. Okay. I haven't had like, any coffee today. <laughs> That's the problem. Okay, what about MA? 70.3. 70.3? Okay, what about MC? 98.44. 98.44. Now, what you probably computed was negative 98.44, right? Yeah. Okay, but use a positive. That's very important. Use a positive. Use absolute values. Now, finally, what is M max going to be? What's the maximum moment on the entire segment? Like looking here. What's that? No, 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 no. On the entire segment. Look at this. What's that? M1 at 30. At 30. It's over here. But we already know what that is, right? Like, we, we know what that is from, uh, from the moment diagram up here. We know that that's negative 225, right? So this, this right here, this is negative 225. So M max is negative 225. In other words, what I'm getting at is it's either this point or this point. But it can't be this point because the peak here was like 120 and then it was going down. So it's got to be what it is over here, right? But remember, use positive 20, 
225. So therefore, what is CB? What is CB for this segment? Point six three. Do I have a second on that? Anybody? Yes. Sir. Okay, good. All right. We're running short on time, so here's what I'm going to do. If you would like practice, my suggestion would be to try out M2 or the third segment. The CB for the third segment is 2.33 if you want to see if you're getting the same answer I do. Um, now, for the homework assignment, what I've done is I've given you a very straightforward problem, but I want you to assess two bracing scenarios. One, where it's only braced at the ends, and the other, where it's braced at the ends and at mid-span. See what you get for the different CBs. The only thing I will tell you, look at the hints, because in a weird way, I'm also giving you the solution at the same time. So... You'll see what I mean. I'll, the whole point of this homework is to derive the answer. It doesn't really matter what the answer is because you can look it up. That's all I got. I will see you all next time. M2. Yes, yes, you would use M2 for this segment. Yes, that's sort of the point, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't, I thought we were talking about the, the yeah. No, you were right. <laughs>